And let us now prepare our hearts and minds for a rich encounter with the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Please stand and join me as we say our call to worship that you will find in the bulletin from Psalm 16. The Lord is my chosen portion. It is my cup. He holds my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. This is my Father's world, and 
This is our Father's world, and what we see on the sixth day of creation after God had made everything, he called it very good. And everything was great in the world, and we were entrusted, as the hymn just said, to take care of that world. Unfortunately for us, if we're honest with ourselves, we realize that we don't always live into what God would want us to do. We do things we ought not to do, or we don't do some of the things that we should do. And so there's this sin that's kind of broken down that relationship and kind of messed up this perfect world that God has created. The good news for us, though, is that God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. And our Father in heaven loved us so much that he sent his son to die so that we could have that restored relationship. And so we've got this time in worship now where we take seriously that sin and we have this unison prayer of confession and we confess our sins because we know that that is the start of living anew and trying to do better. So let us pray now our unison prayer of confession. Holy and gracious Lord of all humanity and all that dwells upon the earth, we join our voices as one in full recognition that we have unified in one thing for certain which is, we sin. Our sin that we commit is against you and we will only. We dismiss our neighbor. We have sinned against you. When we spout off in anger, we do so against you. When we deal deceptively with another, we have lied to you. When we abuse the creation, we have abused that which you have called very good. Forgive us, Lord. Stir in us a deep passion to honor you in all that we do. We pray all this through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, hear this good news. God offers us forgiveness and a chance to live anew. We see this transformation, and we'll hear it again in our Old Testament reading, where God says our sin was like scarlet, but he changes and transforms us to be as white as snow. Or he says it's like crimson and then says that we are changed to be as white as wool. And so know that God has the power and loves you to transform you into this white, beautiful thing. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament lesson this morning can be found on page 1060 of your Pew Bible. And we're looking at one of our major prophets, Isaiah chapter 1, verses 12 through 20. Listen now to the word of the Lord as it's recorded in Isaiah 1, 12 through 20. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations... I cannot bear your evil assemblies, your new moon festivals, and your appointed feasts. My soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. 
Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Morning, boys and girls and church family. So, today's Father's Day. First of all, happy Father's Day to all of our amazing dads. Kids, I hope that you spend all day today making your dad feel extra, extra special. But in addition to Father's Day, I have to tell you, I've got camp brain right now. Uh, summer's best two weeks is starting tomorrow, as Pastor Ted already said. I am so excited. Like, this has been two years in the making, and we are thrilled. We are so ready. Um, so what I would like to do is spend this children's moment time actually praying for us as we get started with camp. Because really, you can have the best activities, and you can have the greatest this and that, and have everything lined up. But apart from God, it, it doesn't amount to a hill of beans. And so we really want to pray and make sure that we are tapping into to the real source of truth and love and life and, and not lose sight of that. So if you are... We're going to have you stand up right where, we, where, where you are so we can pray for you. If you are a camper or a work crew member or a junior counselor or a senior counselor or a volunteer in any kind of way, just please stand up right where you are. We're not going to make you say anything. We're just going to pray for you. We've got a few folks. Awesome. Awesome. And so the rest of us are going to pray for you, and we're going to pray for camp right now. So please pray with me. Lord, we thank you so much for the amazing opportunity we have to gather together these next two weeks. We thank you in advance for the fun that we're going to have, for the learning that we're going to have, for the friends we're going to make, for, for all the awesome stuff that's going to happen. We thank you. Um, for the amazing team you've put together to lead it. We thank you for all the kids who are coming, and we pray a special blessing upon each of them. We pray that you would help us to always keep our eyes fixed on you um, and that we would be doing things first and foremost that make you happy and give you glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Quick thing, go. So today is our first day of Children's Church in forever. I totally forgot to tell you. So if you are four years old through those entering second grade, if you'd like to come upstairs with me, you may do so now, and I'll meet you back there, and we'll head on up. <laughs> We stand and lift up our hands, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now, how great, how awesome is He, and together we sing.
seated. Well, I, think, I can't think of any worse thing to be embarrassed of, being able to shout out that you're a friend of God. I think that all works. <laughs> oh, boy. What a great day to gather before the presence of a holy God, my friend. So, as we prepare to hear God's word proclaimed, let's draw our attention to his text. That's right here in Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 33. You can follow along if you like. You can find that in your pew Bibles on page 1623. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version, so it may be a little bit different than what you have in the pews. <clears throat> Now, great crowds accompanied Jesus. And he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and it is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king... Going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to join me now in prayer. Oh, Lord God Almighty, on this Father's Day, we recognize that we can come before you and attend to your Spirit's lead as we seek to understand this text. It truly puts us in the crosshairs of confusion. How do we understand this? And so, Lord, we pray that you would give us wisdom. We pray that your Spirit would move among us even this morning as we seek to be obedient in your call. So, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations upon our hearts be made acceptable in your sight, for you alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I hate you! Eh? Some of us have heard that. Maybe some of us have done that. Yeah, the door slams, and all of a sudden, it comes out full throttle, you know? Everything that's bottled up and the frustration you have, and you let your mom know it, you let your dad know it. Oh, you know, but I'm thinking, I'm pretty sure this is not the qualifier that Jesus is talking about in this text of being a disciple. Matter of fact, I can pretty much bank on it. But how do we understand this text anyway? Because it seems to stand in stark contrast to what it is that God tells us. Because we're supposed to honor our mother and father, right? That's like one of the big ten. It's number five. And it's the only one that comes with a promise. Yeah, how can you honor your parents if you don't love them? Or at least a modicum of love, at least. And then... You know, there's Paul. He writes to the church of Ephesus and, and he even references back to the Ten Commandments as he's instructing those people of Ephesus saying, hey, make sure you honor your mom and dad, kiddos. 
Now, that's pretty important. And then Jesus, oh, yeah, he lowers the boom on the old Pharisees at one point because they were stashing cash away for themselves to make a donation. Meanwhile, their parents were hurting. And Jesus was calling them on the carpet about it and saying, what's this? You guys are a bunch of two-faced snakes. Yeah. So how do we understand this passage of hate your dad, hate your mom? that Jesus puts out here as we take our journey through the difficult sayings of Jesus. Seems like an inappropriate text to have on a Father's Day. But ultimately, it really is the best text for a Father's Day. Because you see, dads, if you're to look in the encyclopedia and turn the page to the word hyperbole, there'd be a picture of a dad right there. Because dads are like, they are the apex. They're the quintessential. They are the fulfillment of cosmic destiny when it comes to hyperbole. I mean, they just know it the best. If they were to go on a fishing trip or on a hunting trip or whatever it is, they'll show you the pictures of the animals that they would be able to bring down either land as a fish or bring down as an elk or a deer. And then they'll go on and tell you and regale you of the story of the one they missed, the one with the rack that's half a mile wide and the fish that's 20,000 pounds that almost took off their arm, you know, and all this stuff. And that's not even to talk about the one-armed fisherman who caught a fish this big. <laughs> you know, I mean, hyperbole is part of a dad's nature. You know, son, let me tell you something. When I had to go to school, it was uphill both ways, and the sun beat down like magma. You know, come on, dad, seriously. You know, this is what dads do. And if you talk to any wife out here, they'll readily tell you that when a dad gets sick, you might as well just sign the death certificate. That's all I'm saying. You know, they, they lay in bed and moan and groan like the world is coming to an end and they need to get to the hospital. And, oh, I'm dying here. And all the while, their nose is running. Now, I'm just saying... This is how dads are. They are the pinnacle of hyperbole. And Jesus loves hyperbole. He lives in that world of hyperbole. And he uses it to drive home a point. And what is the point that Jesus is driving home here? Discipleship. Discipleship. That's what he wants us to focus in on. What does it mean to be a disciple? Now, for us to fully comprehend this challenge that he's putting before these hearers, right? You know, we got to go back a little bit in the text because it's just, I mean, it is ripe, absolutely ripe for us to understand what Jesus is doing in the world of hyperbole here. Because here he is, and all these people are gathered around him to hear what he has to say. Now, just about maybe a day before, you know, that, that evening before, he was invited to be with the high muckety-muck of the Pharisees. I mean, the ruler of the Pharisees. He's invited to his house for a dinner party. Now, I don't know about you, but if you've ever been to a dinner party that involves the boss, you know what happens at these things. So there's Jesus on the Sabbath, now that's a whole nother issue. I don't understand how he's able to celebrate a huge high muckety-muck dinner on the Sabbath and have all these people there. But, oh, yeah, there it is. He gets away with things, I guess. So here, here's the high muckety-muck Pharisee inviting everybody over for this dinner party. And in typical business dinner party fashion, you know what's happening there. There is the pandering. There is the posturing. There's the superficial. There's all this kind of, kind of getting yourself into these positions to try and affect a positive influence upon somebody to see you, and you're talking about your great exploits and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it is thick with BS. 
Let's call it what it is. It's exactly what goes on in these dinner parties. Everybody is like trying to impress the next person and especially the host of the dinner party because they're thinking if I can do that, then I'm going to get a favorable review which will get me higher up in the ladder. That's what's going on. It's called a spade a spade. We've been to these things. We've seen them. Networking dinner parties. Come on. And Jesus sees right through it. I mean, like a laser. And what did he do for the very first thing of his kind of cutting through the garbage? He sees this guy that's lame. <laughs> and he says, hey, buddy, come on over here. He's like, ah. Uh. He's like, yeah, that's right. You can't come over here. But let me tell you something. You can right now. And all of a sudden, he heals this lame guy on the Sabbath at the ruler of the Pharisee's house. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I love it. Because Jesus is putting them on the hot seat. And then he goes on from there. And he calls them right into their eyes. And he said, yeah, all you guys are coming around here. You're posturing. You're pandering. You're doing all this kissing up sycophants, all this jazz going on at this dinner party, trying to figure out who gets the best seat at this dinner party. Let me tell you something. And he goes and he tells this little parable about not looking for the seat of honor at the dinner party. And then he tells this other parable, which is really good. And it's the one that gets right between the bone and the marrow, man. He cuts right down with the truth, right into the heart of these guys. And he tells this story about a man who wanted to throw a great banquet just like the one you're at right now. <laughs> and, and all the while, all these people are saying, oh, sorry, man, can't come. I guess got married. Oh, I bought a cow, unable to come. Sorry, sorry. What's Jesus saying? He's saying, let's take a peek at where your heart is when it comes to discipleship. Let's take a peek at really what's at value here because I'm going to tell you to hate your dad and to hate your mom. What? Yeah. Jesus is telling these people, and he said, you want to know what it means to be in discipleship? Here's what it looks like. I'm going to tell you exactly what it looks like. It looks like this. It looks like you cannot be a phony baloney. That's what it first looks like. You cannot have a half-baked commitment to the Lord God Almighty. That's what it looks like. You can't be a narcissist caught up in loving yourself and all the things that you bring to the company. Right? No. That's not going to fly in Jesus' world. Because Jesus hates it. So I started thinking about this. What is it ultimately that God hates? Because really it's not that he hates moms or dads. He hates a behavior. He hates an attitude. Right? And so I start digging through scripture and I come to Proverbs 6. And if you've got a Bible there before you, you can take a peek at this. Or if you know how to count we're going to do this because <laughs> this is amazing. So here in Proverbs 6, verse 16, the Lord counts out or kind of identifies six things. No, 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 scratch that. Seven things that he absolutely despises, right? So it says this. He says, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to the Lord. Number one. Haughty eyes. Looking at yourself more highly than you ought to. Thinking you're the best thing since sliced bread and even beyond. God hates it. Number two, a lying tongue. Yeah, that's number 10 in the big 10. Do not bear false witness. He hates it. He hates it. Putting on a false front, Right? Bad news. Number three, the hands that shed innocent blood. Yeah, God has no time for that. 
Number four, a heart that devises wicked plans. Ooh, now this one should hurt for a lot of people. Because what is it that sometimes we think about when somebody hurts us? We want to get revenge. What is it that we think about sometimes when we want to try and outmaneuver somebody else because we think we're more qualified for the position and we'll do whatever it takes to make that person look bad? Hmm, ouch, right? How about this one? Feet that make haste to run to evil. Oh, God hates that. Here's another one. A false witness who breathes out lies. Oh, that one we've already heard, but we'll hear it again because God really hates it. <laughs> so, you know, watch your tongue. Watch what you're trying to present about yourself. Number three, or number seven. One who sows discord among the brothers and sisters. And that's not just blood relation. Wow. Wow. God hates it. So it makes me think, you know, even as we look at Isaiah 1 that Ryan did just a masterful job of reading, we go to another level. So we have these seven behaviors that God hates. And then we read Isaiah chapter 1 where Isaiah is launching his ministry. And what is it that God hates? He hates our worship. He hates your offering. He hates everything that you do with your prayers and everything else. That's what he's saying in Isaiah. He can't stand them. He despises them. Why? That should be the question we ask. Holy mackerel. God does not like it at all. I despise your feasts, he says. Wow. You know, this is the stuff you start to think about and it makes you scratch your head and go, what does this mean? Well, let me tell you again, Jesus is not calling us to hate our moms and dads. He's calling us to hate what he hates. And he does that by calling out an attitude and a practice that runs contrary to what he desires. And so on this Father's Day, man, does this work out quite well. Because I'll tell you what, I don't know a good dad in this room that wouldn't do what Jesus is doing right now to their own children. If you see your child falling off the rails or kind of veering off the path, what are you going to do? You're not your kid's best friend. You're your kid's dad. You're your kid's mom. You're going to pull them back into the right behavior. You're going to pull them back onto the rails. You're going to make them see the, the wrong that they were pursuing or the attitude that they were embracing that was not acceptable in this house. How many times have we said that to your, parents, your kids? So kids, don't get ticked off at your parents for holding you accountable. Because what they're looking for is that you would become the most excellent of what you can possibly be. That's what a dad, that's what a mom seeks for you. They want to see you excel so much. They want to see you get to the highest potential of who you're created to be in the image of God. They want you to be a person that can go out into the world and affect positive change. They see that in you. And they want to see that happen. This is what Jesus sees in us. And he wants to see that happen. He loves you so much that he's not going to put up with the garbage. He can cut right through the BS. And he sees it and he calls it for what it is. So if you're going to come to Jesus with a half heart or think about, oh, I'll get to read in the Bible whenever it's convenient, just know that God's going to sit there and say, hey, brother, no, 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 no. That's unacceptable behavior. Absolutely unacceptable behavior. This is what God requires of you. 
If you're wondering if you want your prayers to be heard or to be answered or to be in an intimate relationship with the Holy God, well, examine how is it that you're spending time with God? Is it something that you're doing on the loose end of whatever's left over? Or are you making this a priority? That's what Jesus is saying here. He doesn't want to hear you saying, well, I've done this and I've got this person in my pedigree and I've got this that's happened behind me. I've got these gifts, blah, blah, blah. Jesus is saying, go take a hike with all that. I want to see your heart and I want to see that commitment. I want to see purity and integrity of intent. I want to see sincerity. That's what Jesus wants. And isn't that what any dad wants from their child? Isn't that what any mom wants from her child? Integrity, sincerity, trustworthiness, right? This is what Jesus is looking for. Man, I couldn't think of a better passage for Father's Day. Calling us on the carpet for who we are so that we can become better people and specifically better disciples. That's what it is. Today we baptize the little baby. You can see the baptismal vows that are printed in your bulletin. This little baby, Clinton, Clinton Holmes. Boy, is he a cutie pie. And those baptismal vows are right there in the bulletin. And unfortunately, you folks weren't able to be a part of it, but you are by, eh, by spirit now. And I want you to think seriously about those vows, the vows that are printed there. Because each of you have repeated those vows. Each of you have said, I intend to do this. Whether you're a parent with a small child seeking to nurture them in the truth of Jesus Christ, or you've just been confirmed and you confirm those baptismal vows that your parents have made. Or you just are a regular member and you remember your own baptismal vow that you made or your own confirmation or the vow that you made on behalf of that child. If you want to see what God also hates, look at Zechariah 8. Because God has no time for a person who does a half-hearted vow. None. And here we are on this baptismal Sunday. And we're thinking seriously about a vow that we make before the presence of a holy God. What is it that you're doing to nurture that vow? How is it that you're engaged in a purposeful relationship with Jesus Christ to be able to live into the responsibility of what it means to share that truth with the next generation? How is it that your commitment to Jesus is affecting and impacting the decisions that you make? These are the questions that you constantly should be thinking about. This is what Jesus wants. You're going to follow Jesus? He's not looking for somebody who's just going to be pandering, kissing up to try and make himself look good or to affect some positive influence like at a dinner party. He doesn't care what your pedigree is and how many people you know or how many names you can drop. He doesn't care about that at all. He doesn't care about how wonderful you are to be able to do all these things that you've done that you might put on your resume or your CV. If you're putting all your identity on all that garbage, Jesus is going to call it for what it is. Because if that's where your trust is, well, then let me read to you verses 34 and 35. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So the BS of that dinner party where everyone's trying to smooth around and make themselves seem like they're the next best thing to ever come across the planet Earth Jesus is saying, if that's your attitude about yourself as well, you find that to be way more important than the discipleship that you have with Jesus, then guess what? 
That's of no value at all, and it goes right to where the BS resides on the manure pile. That's where it goes. So hate your dad. Hate your mom. In context. Because when we look at the context here, it comes to the bottom line. It says in verse 33, So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. I love that word there because in the Greek, what it's saying is basically farewell. So it tempers what that phrase is at the top of hating mom and dad. Because what you're doing is putting in proper perspective and priority. To be able to say farewell to the things of the past. To be able to say to those items that used to impact you and used to guide you and you used to put value in, all of those things, you're saying, sayonara, baby, because I'm moving on and I'm following Jesus. It's just like a kid that graduates from college. You don't want them living in your basement. You want them moving on. And that child wants to move on. And they're looking at you and they're saying, Mom and Dad, yeah, I'm out. I'm moving to Minneapolis. <laughs> okay, off to Minneapolis you go, and I'm praying for you. What is it? That child wants to make a name for themselves. They want to set off and do what God has gifted them to do. So if we take that and we look at that from a bigger perspective of what it is, we're saying goodbye to everything that was part of our past, of what it was that defined us, what it is that we put value in, all of that. We're saying goodbye and maybe good riddance because we're looking to the future of where it is that Jesus is calling you to go. As a faithful disciple, that's what it's all about, my friends. On this Father's Day, our eyes are on our Heavenly Father. And He's calling you. And He's calling you to a faithful journey of discipleship that places your priorities in the right order. Amen. And we join our voices now saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, let's stand and give glory to God in our final song. I worship you.
something very, very assuring about that song. We sing those lyrics and we know as we think about our walk of discipleship and the demand that Christ puts before us to have that as our first priority, that is very intimidating. But he's a way maker because that's who he is. And so as we walk out of this place, as we seek to live in faithful discipleship, know that it's Christ that's making the way for you, my friends. So go with boldness, reflect compassion, and express forgiveness, and give grace. And kids, know that your dad loves you. All right? Know that. And make sure that as you go out into the world, that you reflect that same love to your heavenly Father. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, let the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Truth and justice shines like the